Ladies and gents, welcome back. It's, uh, it's time for an alternative paper review. First up this morning to the Financial Times, who is suggesting that pretty much in line with everyone's predictions, the implementation of voter ID in UK elections risks disenfranchisement of certain groups. This is what amazes me about UK politics. It's not just the lack of consequence. It's not just how people never seem to actually pay a price for their literal crimes that they've committed in office, but also concurrently the lack of evidence that you need to get a policy like over the line. Like they implemented voter ID last year for the local elections and the evidence for doing so or the uh, justification for doing so. I mean, they didn't really have any evidence. The justification was like, well, we need to guard against voter fraud. And nobody could present any evidence that voter fraud was even a slight issue in the UK. Meanwhile, everyone could present evidence that introducing voter ID would result in certain people not being able to cast their vote. But you know, the uh, the symbolism over substance Tories don't let a little thing like evidence <laughs> get in the way of them rolling out a new policy, do they? So in came voter ID, along with it came stories of about 14,000 people being turned away from the ballot box. And now, shockingly, the head of the Electoral Commission is like, well, maybe this isn't actually what we want to do, guys. But don't worry. Don't worry, rest assured, he's, he's reached his conclusion. They've concluded, they agree that the risks of disenfranchisement and therefore sort of skewering elections in certain constituency, the risks far outweigh the benefits of any sort of actual legitimate concern of voter fraud. But don't worry, they have also agreed it's, it's probably too late to remove voter ID from the incoming general election. So you'll still have to produce your voter ID. There will still be very much voter disenfranchisement in the upcoming GE, probably to the Conservative Party's benefit. Next up to the Daily Express, who herald a revolutionary new medical procedure that claims to be able to detect the first signs of Alzheimer's from over a decade before the patient becomes symptomatic. And this is in the Telegraph as well. I mean, they're playing it kind of fast and loose, aren't they? Like, guys, guys, Express, Telegraph, editors and sub-editors, why are you amping up this treatment for Alzheimer's? I mean, if this leads to a cure or the eradication of Alzheimer's in Britain, if there were no dementia in the UK in time, you guys could be left with no readers at all. Next up to The Sun, who continue their service to investigative journalism by excreting out this lovely bit of royal PR guff. The Queen. <laughs> The Queen. Queen Camilla has told King Charles he's gotta, you gotta slow down, you, you, you workaholic, you. And this is just the latest bit of, uh, you know, Royal Buckingham Palace PR positive stuff that's come out after the Prince Andrew things about, you know, two, three weeks ago. And if you're interested in this shift, this changing of the narrative following Andrew Gate, following Epstein and the testimony that backed up the previous testimony and how that story has magically changed into Fergie being diagnosed with skin cancer, Kate having a tummy bug, King Charles's prostate. If you want to talk a little bit more about that, I just did a podcast episode about that last night. You can go and check that out. I think it's out on Spotify and Apple and the rest of them. It'll come out tomorrow. But Patreons and YouTube community members will get it now. Finally, from royals feeling poorly to royally crushed, the Rwanda vote took place in the House of Lords last night. So you'll recall that last week it was in the Commons, it passed the Commons, then it goes up to the House of Lords who thrash it to pieces, scrutinise it, they send it back to the Commons with notes, various clauses and bits that they're uncomfortable with. And this follows Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's warning last week, like, don't obstruct the will of the people, Lords. This is my flagship policy. Don't, don't get in the way. This is the will of the people. Just side, don't even scrutinise it. Just make it law. But unfortunately for Rishi Sunak, it is not the Prime Minister's job to tell the Lords what to not do and what to do. It is very much the Lords job to scrutinise government policy. Now, interestingly, this very public humiliation of the Rwanda policy and of Rishi Sunak and his leadership, this hasn't appeared really on any of the front pages of the papers this morning. Now, you might say that's because it happened so late in the day yesterday that they missed the deadline to put it on the front page. I don't think that's what happened. I mean, it was only like, was it like half eight or nine o'clock last night? That's not too late. So personally, I think, and maybe the cynics among you may also believe 
that the reason this hasn't ended up on the front pages is because this is a humiliation for our current Tory Prime Minister. And frankly, the hacks at the Telegraph, the Times, the Sun, the Express, they would rather that you were talking about Alzheimer's cures and how hard the king works than focusing on an economically unviable, hugely immoral, politically impossible Rwanda policy. Finally, finally, a story that sort of came into my periphery. Uh, it's not really in any of the papers, but it is this hysteria that's bubbling up on Twitter about private school fees. Yesterday saw a load of weird accounts coming up, clutching their pearls about like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm laying awake at night, petrified about what's going to happen to us as a family as a result of this labour hiking private school fees. Now, it's difficult to take any of these things seriously, isn't it? Like, did they care about you when your mortgage or your rent exploded? Did they care about the families down the street when they were campaigning for free school meals? Were they like, oh, if you can't afford kids, don't have them. Now that the same hiking of costs and financial struggle is finally coming to knock on the upper middle class's door. Now what we're witnessing is a metamorphosis from Tories into activists. And look, I just I just want to say a quick word of reassurance to those people affected by the incoming Labour administration's removal of VAT exempt status from private schools, which is very likely to result in upping their fees. A quick word of reassurance from me. Yes, it might feel scary that you're going to be hit with an extra like hundreds of pounds a month, probably in, in bills. Yes, you might be frightened by growing inequality in the United Kingdom, the unfairness, the financial plight. But listen, guys, you can at least take solace <laughs> in the fact that if inequality continues to grow at the rate that it has done since the Tories came to power, in 2010, if inequality continues to soar at the current rate, surely we will be living in a neo-Victorian futuristic dystopia where all of us are poor, hungry and malnourished. And I know, I know that sounds bad, right? But just think of it this way, right? If it continues to grow, like all, all of that, basically all of us will end up in the same boat. And so logically, technically, will mostly be equal. So in a weird way, inequality will have been eradicated. Anyway, that's it from me, guys. Don't forget to click join. Join my community. I'm doing an in-person meetup in London in March. So if you want to come and meet me, have a few beers, put the world to rights over its many, many wrongs, hit the join button now or don't. <laughs> Those are realistically your options here. Uh, peace.